Hello doers and welcome back. Today we're going to discuss how to use the master production schedule or MPS for my acronym lovers so that you can pump up your company's planning capabilities to the max. The Master production schedule is a long term planning tool that gives you a bird's eye view of your overall production. It's based on your company's aggregate plan, but requires additional inputs like the demand forecast, inventory levels and customer orders. In return, the master production schedule provides you with the quantity you need to produce, the remaining inventory, and the overall amount of product you can promise to customers. When set up correctly, the MPS prepares you for fluctuations in demand so that you can prevent stockouts, perform effective cost control, and plan your company's cash inflow. MPS is also helpful for dealing with seasonal products. If we use models to help us forecast peak demand periods, the MPS can help us plan our manufacturing, taking production capacity and lead times into account. Here at Stealthywood, we also work with seasonal products, like winter holiday decorations. And if you're like me, you know it's never too early to start decorating for the holidays. So, enough chit-chat, let's go make our house look spooky and very festive. First things first, let's quickly review the bill of materials or bomb for our Christmas painting by going up here to products, bill of materials, and selecting it. Now, I can see that it's made up of a frame, backing board, and printed canvas. Now, that's easy enough. We also need to make sure that we've activated the master production schedule itself by going up to configuration and settings. Underneath the planning section, make sure that little checkbox next to master production schedule is checked off and save your settings. Great. While we're here, we also have the option to choose what time range over here that we want to view in our MPS, as well as the number of columns. For now, I'm going to keep the default settings, which will show us 12 months. Now to go view that MPS, we're going to select planning and master production schedule. Great, but it's blank. So first, you need to add the products to schedules that you want to plan out. So select add a product. Let's go with that Christmas painting again. Now we also have the option to select the bill of materials. I filled it out. What would happen if you don't? If you leave this field blank, the MPS will only show the product and not the bomb itself. Now here I can also define safety stock target, which is the extra inventory we can keep to prevent a stock out. I can also indicate the minimum and the maximum values to replenish. For now, I'm gonna leave these all as they are and just hit save. Great, stuff has appeared now. And now we can see the forecast for the painting as well as all of its components over here. Now by default, the following fields are displayed. We have the forecasted demand, which is the estimated future demand for a product. We also have the suggested replenishment, which tells us how much of a product we should order to keep up with demand. And finally, we have forecasted stock, which tells us how much inventory we should keep to keep up with that demand as well. Everything right now is zero because we haven't set up a forecasted demand yet. For each product, I can actually adjust the safety stock target or minimum and maximum replenishment quantities whenever I want to. All I have to do is hit this little target across from forecasted stock and a pop-up appears over here. I can adjust it to my liking, but for right now, I'm going to hit cancel on that. Now, clicking on over here where we have the unequal or less than sign above it, takes us to the same exact pop-up. So we're gonna cancel that out too. Now finally, if I have a lot of products visible on the MPS and I wanna view just one of them, I can simply search for it by typing in something like, let's see the frame over here. And boom, there it is. All right, now that we've reviewed the default settings, it's time to get crazy over here. Let's add some of those additional fields to this bad boy. Now the way we do that, by clicking on rows that we have right there, and now we can add some of them. Now right here we have the actual demand which is based on confirmed sales orders. So when we check actual demand, it'll show as a fraction of the forecasted demand value. Now let's say that I want to view the last year's actual demand. So we're gonna do actual demand Y1 over there. Boom, this generates a new row containing last year's demand. And then over here, we have the actual replenishment that we have right there. And what does that do? Well, it provides us replenishment values based on confirms RFQs along with manufacturing orders. So when we have that option there, Boom, we have it. And now it displays as a fraction of the suggested replenishment. And then finally, we have available to promise over here. And that is the quantity of products we can sell at the end of a period. And when we check it, look at that. It can be viewed as well as a fraction of the forecasted stock on the same page. Phew, all right, that was a lot of info I know. So why don't we enter actual values into the MPS and see how that magic works. So the first value we'll want to define for each month is the forecasted demand, since the MPS is based on forecasted and actual demands. Now the forecasted demand has to be entered manually, but this is a seasonal product, so we only got to do a couple months. So I'm loosely going to base my estimates on last year's actual demand. So starting with November over here, we had 800, then we had 950, 
Somehow a thousand. And finally it goes down again at 900. A lot of stuff happened when I did that. Now you'll notice that these forecasted demand values for the final product will affect the indirect demand forecast for each of my components. So I don't need to manually forecast everything, which is super handy. And in this case, the ratio of each component to the finished product is one to one. So the demand values are directly proportional, as you could tell when we have the 800 there. And then each of them is also there. Great. Now the suggested replenishment value that we have up here has also been populated automatically. And since I don't have any products or components in stock, it's going to be the same as the forecasted demand right above it. If I want to change the suggested replenishment value manually, I can actually just do that by changing it in here. Let's assume that this was actually 950. Oh no, would you look at that? When I click away, an X button shows up and it tells me, it gives me the option to reset this to what it actually was in case I had butterfingers. Now, the available to promise value is, you guessed it, also calculated automatically. And it equals the replenishment minus the actual demand. Okay, now that we understand what the MPS values mean and everything, let's move on to replenishment. When I hover the word replenish over here, look at that, Odoers. Odoo highlights the earliest cell that needs replenishment. When I click on replenishment, boom. It applies the actual replenishment. The cell has now turned gray since it's adjusted and actual replenishment values are equivalent. When I hover it again, now this time it's showing me the next earliest month, December. Now this time, let's see what happens when I replenish more than is required by the demand. So we're going to hit 1,000 in here instead of 950. Now when I hit replenish and click on that X, would you look at that? The cell turns red since we replenish more than the originally suggested quantity. Now for the next month, let's see what happens when I replenish less than the suggested quantity. So for this one, we're going to put 900 right there. Boom. Look at that, oh doers. If I click away, I'll notice that my forecasted stock is now negative relative to the forecasted demand, which means I'm replenishing too little over here, oh doers. Now for the purpose of this example, I'm going to click replenish anyway on that one. And then when we hit the X, look at that. The cell is now yellowy orange because the actual replenishment is less than suggested right there. All right, one more thing and then we're done. If I want to look at my actual replenishment documents, all I have to do is click on the bolded number that represents the actual replenishment right there. If we click over here, we see we have 800 of these manufacturing orders. And look at that. They are all at this point confirmed. And what does that mean, Odoovers? Well, if we go back over here to the master production schedule, I'll talk about that. Now, the process of determining and applying replenishment values for components is the same as the final product. For example, let's look at, in our case, we have the frame component that we had over here. If we click over here to the actual replenishment button, and then we select the value, in this case, we have 800 RFQs. And I'll see that that's because we purchased the frames instead of manufacturing them. Now, for this to work, you'll need to have a vendor set up on the component's product form as well. So make sure that you have that. And finally, if a component is manufactured instead of purchased, its replenishment document will be a manufacturing order, but everything follows the same general flow of logic. These MOs and everything, as you guessed it, will either be in an RFQ or a confirm stage in the case of MOs. And that's it. Now you know how to use the master production schedule in Odoo's manufacturing app. Now it's time to use this to your advantage and become a production scheduling master. Anyways, as always, Odoers, thanks for watching. This one was pretty complex, so go grab yourself a snack.